All right, everybody. Hello. Hope everybody's doing well. It's Dr. Rich Schabner back with you here for Get Rit Live. And today we're talking about self-care in the writing process. So I might as well ask you all, how are you doing? How are things going with your classes, things like that? Um, what are you currently working on and so forth? And you know, um, how are you sort of managing that process? This is uh, the sort of ever burning question we sort of have here when we're um, working on projects like this. I'm just realizing the music is a little loud, so let's just turn it down for just a second. You know, personally for me, music is one way I'm sort of practicing that self-care, often just ways of, um, you know, kind of keeping the vibe, if you will, while, while I'm uh, trying to get work done. But yeah, I mean, what are some things maybe you listen to when you're working on projects? Is that a way that you sort of have those sort of calming feelings, you know, when you're working on um, projects? Things like that to think about why you join the stream. Okay, so we mentioned self-care in the writing process. Let me make a couple announcements before we get started. So today's stream, as I just mentioned, we're talking about self-care in the writing process. In what ways can we take care of ourselves while committing to writing tasks, telling stories, etc.? And to make sense of those kind of questions, we're going to talk about resources um, that you can think about. I'll link to a number of them that are available actually in the show notes. And then we're going to have a guest chat today with Robert W. Feisler, author of the award-winning book, Tinderbox, The Untold Story of the Upstairs Lounge Fire and the Rise of Gay Liberation. Feisler is also a very good friend of mine and is currently working on his next project, a book about anti-queer and anti-black purge or the, the anti-queer and anti-black purge in Florida during the Red Scare in the 1950s. Um, and so really, I wanted to bring him on the show because he's telling these amazing stories, these difficult stories about historical um, tragic events that, that have happened to um, such communities, particularly the gay community. And I just think that um, he has a lot to say about, you know, what, what's kind of at stake when we're telling those stories and how do we, how do we sort of take care of ourselves while we're, we're trying to tell um, a wide range of stories. And so let me just go ahead and share my screen real quick. We can talk about that. Okay. So a couple quick announcements. Um, as always, just be sure to check out the Get Rit Live live stream series page, which has an overview of what's coming up. So as we mentioned, today we're talking about the self-care in the writing process. And next week we're talking about moving from moving writing from the page to the web. So we'll have some guest speakers, students, um, talking about Inventio, which is a publication that is um, uh, ran and sort of operated by uh, Professional Writing Student Association we have in the department. And then we'll end with on December 1st with Cozy Vibes and the winter writing prompts that you might think about. Uh, and this is also associated with the Writing Center, and this is where the, the source series got its start again um, for season two. Started last winter with students in Writ 4001, and now we've moved this to being a part of the Writing Center offerings with workshops and so forth. So really grateful um, for that support from the, the Writing Center and just, you know, a reminder that you can always sign up for one-on-one -on -one appointments as well as sort of group workshops that happen um, in the Writing Center. And I would argue that that is also a practice of self-care, you know, talking to somebody regularly about your writing and sort of what yeah, maybe your common struggles are between you and another writer is really interesting. And I find that I do that all the time in, in my own work. All right, so on to the topic. I mean, before I bring Robert onto the show, I wanna mention a few self-care resources uh, that you might consider as we close the term. This could be a pretty stressful time for many of us writing essays and assignments on deadline, whether it is you know that major essay you have coming up or it's, let's say, a take-home exam you'll be working on in the next few weeks. There's a lot we got to sort of handle and juggle and so forth, but it's always important to remind ourselves that you know we have to take pauses and 
do things that may distract us from those deadlines just a little bit, enough to reset the brain, enough to take care of our bodies and, and so forth. And you know, how might we practice self-care during these very busy times? I'm always reminded of this book that I've read a few times now. It's uh, Haruki Murakami's book, What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And in that, he writes, to deal with something unhealthy, a person needs to be as healthy as possible. That's my motto. In other words, an unhealthy soul requires a healthy body. And he goes on to talk about how professional writers, you know, maybe in um, their sort of more youthful days, don't do a lot to sort of take care of themselves and, you know, have this sort of unrelenting energy to just produce content uh, very creatively. But he kind of goes on to say that these sort of toxins build up in our body with stressors and so forth. Um, things just such as life sort of getting, um, finding its way into our own processes. And this whole book is just about the idea of running in sort of tandem with doing writing. Um, it's a fantastic book. It's a nice memoir. It came from a number of blogs that he was keeping while he was running. And so for him, running is a way to kind of release those toxins, um, calling sort of writing unhealthy, maybe a little dangerous, you know, it's a unhealth, unhealthy part of the soul. But I think what he's saying is that because the stressors of writing kind of build up so quickly, it's important to, to walk about or do something similar to, you know, free your mind up and your body up just a little bit. There are also a number of resources that I've linked to in the description that I would recommend that you check out if you're still thinking about this and sort of what you might do. I linked to a few articles from the Pointer Institute, which is largely an institute that focuses on um, issues that journalists face in the writing process. And I find this to be really interesting because journalists in particular have to tell or often tasked with telling these really difficult stories out in the public. Um, and finding a community, for example, figuring out what you're actually capable of doing. I mean, I see this all the time in writing projects where we want to um, sort of write about everything we can under a particular topic, and that could be a huge stressor. And the sort of parallel I would make to this is what Justin George tells the pointer, which is, you know, there are things happening all the time in Baltimore I can't do it all. Um, it's going to be emotionally taxing to just tell two of these stories. So if you are telling these kind of traumatic stories, you're doing research on sort of traumatic incidents, um, just think about what's your kind of thresholds and also how, how deep do you want to go into that? Um, so for example, if you could just tell a case story or case study, for example, of um, you know uh, a particular writer or uh, a sort of participant, that you've interviewed, maybe that's enough for your own your own practice. Uh, this is kind of back to what Mirakami said too, but um, having a full life that balances out the tough work. So having time to recharge, making sure, for example, that you spend some time off between you know the, the assignment and when the deadline is due. I can't tell you enough times how valuable it is to just give yourself that day or two before the deadline to just sit and do something else. A little bit of, you know, emotional, intellectual cross training you might do um, if you can, if you can swing it, because it just, you come back at that piece of writing much, much differently. And, um, you know, knowing that regardless, you're making a difference in your own writing process and you're starting to tell interesting stories. You can't tell them all. You can, you know, in our case, a lot of times when we're in, we're in academia, you know, we can often turn two essays or one essay into two stories, two essays. Um, it's only the beginning, right? And we don't want to disappoint ourselves if we're not able to tackle the topic as fully as we'd like, um, given the certain constraints and deadlines. I mean, that just reminds me, like, I'm a huge stickler of sort of working late into the night. I just refuse to do that anymore because it's not going to get any better if I continue working on it late into the night. Even if I'm on a deadline, I just have to accept that I'm going to miss that done a little bit. Um, I'm going to need to to ask for some additional supports. But if I sort of plan all of that ahead um, while being a little flexible, usually I can still meet that deadline without many issues. 
And there's some other resources here about how um, you know journalists and fact checkers in India have dealt with sort of self-care or managed self-care. So again, like not checking email after 8 p.m. or making sure to have like lunch um, outside of the office, just kind of moving in some capacity, whether it's just to another room or to a whole other space outside of your house can be really valuable. It is getting cold, I realize so that might be a bit of a challenge for us, but um, nevertheless, it's just important to think about giving yourself that break. They also talk about exercising. And again, another sort of thing that Mirakami touches on as well. Um, but also asking, you know, maybe what resources are available to you through York to talk about the sort of, um, you know, issues you're sort of working through. And we think about the writing center as well. If you're having this kind of hang up on a piece of writing, oftentimes the problem isn't going to reveal itself if you just, <laughs> sort of sit there, right? Um, so actually just talking to someone to sort of answer your own questions can be really valuable. Or, you know, maybe not doing any writing in a writing center appointment, just talking about what's the really challenging thing that you're working through. Leading on, on the village, so maybe you have a, a, a trusted sort of colleague or writing buddy you work with in a class. Um, certainly we do that in our department. So I have a colleague I write with on a regular basis just to be sort of mindful of my own research processes and to sort of say like what, what's going on, um, and what's irritating or really, you know, uh, enlightening about the writing process. And I think what this all comes down to is just paying attention to your body, you know, in, in a lot of ways. Um, if you feel that tension sort of building up and it's always hitting you at a certain time of day, for example, if you've been spending hours on a project, maybe it's time to take a break. A chiropractor once told me that um, your body is constantly giving you feedback. We give each other feedback in our own writing, but I don't know if we listen to the feedback of our own body as much as we, we probably like to. All right, so um, we will bring in the guest in just a second. He's kind of hanging here on on the line for a minute. Um, I want to introduce him real quick, and then we'll get to the chat. Okay, so today we are talking with Robert W. Feisler, who is uh, based in New Orleans, an amazing journalist, amazing book author, and a really good friend of mine. Um, Robert W. Feisler is the winner of the 2020 Columbia Journalism School uh, First Decade Award, the 2019 NLGJA, National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association, Journalist of the Year, and a debut nonfiction author. He currently lives with his husband and kittens in New Orleans. He graduated co-valedictorian from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and is a recipient of the Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship and the Linton Fellowship in Book Writing. And there's much more um, to say about those sort of accolades. So a big congrats to him as well. Uh, Pfizer's essays and feature stories have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, which is very notable in creative writing and nonfiction circles, and recognized in roundups of best nonfiction from um, the reputable magazine The Atlantic. He writes about marginalized groups and overlooked people who make the world better for themselves, as such as heroes tend to be exiles and outcasts seeking their own strange forms of freedom. And also here is a link to Tinderbox. It was his first book recently published. Um, and what we see here is just this um, kind of unearthing of a really um, critical moment in gay liberation. So buried for decades, the upstairs lounge tragedies only recently emerged as a catalyzing event of the gay liberation movement. And in the detail of this book, Tinderbox, Pfizer chronicles the tragic, tragic event that claimed the lives of 31 men and one woman on June 24th, 1973 at a New Orleans bar, the largest mass murder of gays until 2016. And so he's telling this story by relying on unprecedented access to survivors and archives and then creating this portrait of a closeted blue collar gay world that flourished before an arsonist ignited an inferno that destroyed an entire community. And again, it's all of this archival work, interviews and so forth that he put together to tell this amazing story. And uh, that's another reason why I wanted to um, speak with Bobby. And 
just to catch up. We've been very good friends for a long time, and I'm very proud of the work he's been doing. So let me go ahead and bring him on on the line, and then we'll talk um, for quite a bit about self care and all things Robert Pfizer. All right. Hi. Did it work, Bobby? How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Did you hear all that hype comment? I loved it. Nice. Loved it. Okay. What a good intro. Keep yeah. going. Yeah, I will. Can you just I, introduce me for like 30 minutes? I could do that if you want. I didn't even mention all these awards you have, like winner of the Edgar Award, a Best Fact Crime, um, eh. you know, the Lambda Awards. Like, eh. I mean, it it's just adds, it adds. It's all nice. It is nice. Yeah. And you should be really happy about that. Like, Best Book of the Year, Kirkus Reviews, Library yeah. Journal, Shelf Awareness. I mean, it just. A it's, part of it's me, a, like, didn't expect any of that. You know, it's it's my debut book. You sort of think it's going to be a quiet release. Um, mm -hmm. And a part of you almost, like, even though I spent, like, five years writing it, I sort of, there's an insecurity about stepping into the arena for the first time and um, inviting all of that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and so a part of me, like, almost uh, was nervous for people to see it and consider it in that way so every time one of these things happened it was all like a, a very special day um that i just never in i i don't know and then and then we writers too are egotistical so of course you spend five years on something you're like yeah it should be. like but really i mean <laughs> no all that stuff just comes as a surprise um yeah and it's not it's not why you do it you know but um mm -hmm. Uh, it does make you feel like a real boy, like a real writer. Uh, as opposed, <laughs> and that's and that I, I think a lot of writers have imposter syndrome, and I think a, a lot of writers don't get enough uh, support collegially. So mm -hmm. ways that we can lift each other up um, is nice. And if and if someone's doing work, especially social justice oriented work, that others think is like this is good, a good way to ensure that that person continues the work. How about you give that person the award? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's, I mean, that's exciting because, yeah, you, like peers are evaluating your work, these these judges and audiences and so forth. And, you know, you're getting invitations to go talk about the book in different ways. So there's a payoff. Um, but, I mean, yeah, sure. to keep adding that list of, of accolades is really exciting for you. So, again, congrats. Right. And then it enables you. That, that became my... Um, my material, my grist to then press a case for a second queer history book, which I was able to do. So yeah. I'm very grateful that all that stuff happened because that allows you as a writer to keep stay in business, to keep um to keep doing what you do and to keep putting out the kind of messages you want to put out. Fantastic. Yeah. So what are you working on right now? I mean, we're going to talk about the Watermill Center in a minute. Yeah. That's where you're writing right now. But what are you working on after this mm -hmm. you know, really uh, fantastic project? With yeah, I'm working on my second queer history book, uh, which is about a little known um, anti-queer, anti-black purge that happened in 1950s, 1960s Florida under the guise of anti-communism and the Red Scare. Um, and it was led by a Democratic state populist, a real demagogue guy named Charlie Johns, who um, violated uh, civil rights uh, so willy-nilly and also became uh, so locally famous and celebrated for this nine-year-long purge in Florida that, that the committee that he held beca became known as the Johns Committee. Like, it was his. Mm. It had his name yeah. on it. Yeah. And uh, it resulted in the jailing of many uh, Black NAACP activists that were trying to integrate public schools. And then also the firing, uh, the outing and firing of, of uh, several dozen closeted uh, queer professors at the University of Florida. And then also the firing of hundreds of public school teachers who were closeted queer in Florida or suspected queer uh, as well. And then the expelling mm. of about a thousand students. Um, wow. So it was a clear cut, um, a clear cutting of subversives in the state under the guise of a sovereignty commission uh, that was constantly looking for enemies, essentially anyone that was different in the era of panic that followed Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, and then in 55, it was the second decision, which said that separate but equal doesn't work. So that caused mm -hmm. a freak out in the South, and then they, the South had been observing um, McCarthy, had been observing federal abuses, Hollywood blacklist, et cetera, and decided, we're going to use that anti-communism stuff 
to sort of to try to preserve our world. Um, yeah. And it culminated in this committee that lasted for nine years that then overshot its aim. And it culminated in the, the, the Florida State Committee, the Johns Committee's publication of a document called the Purple Pamphlet, which is this, is, this was mm. supposed to be a mid 60s warning about the dangers of homosexuality. It was printed by the state of Florida. So it's got like the state seal on it. Wow. And uh, the document itself contained pictures that were contained called pornographic immediately after its publication. Now, how hot is that? And it was um, declared <laughs> obscenity. It was declared obscenity. And, really? um, uh, and queer folk around the country is a sort of tongue in cheek gesture. This is a, a glossary of homosexual terms that the state mm -hmm. published. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. As a tongue in cheek gesture, queer folk around the country could buy copies of this for about, um, it was about a dollar or so with shipping. And then they would campily display it on their, on their coffee tables around the country. And that caused a lot of backlash against the, the Johns Committee. Um, and it resulted in its demise and also eventually um, the uh, the loss of Charlie Johns in Florida of his Senate seat. Um, mm. And so it's this, it's about this nine year long time in the 50s where I don't know why people think about the 50s and such this halcyon bygone. Oh, wasn't it great back then way? Because like I'm, I'm sort of just using that. Uh, I want to culturally blow that all up. And I also mm. want to showcase mm. how a lot of. Um, a lot of the intolerance and bigotry that developed in what we would call Christian conservatism or social conservatism came out of Florida and it came out of actually the ground seeded by Charlie Johns for nine years in this purge that um, many justified on religious grounds. Hmm. So that's, that's what I'm working on. And uh, all the Johns committee documents, Charlie Johns died surrounded by family lovingly in like uh, 89, 90 and 1990. And then, then the state of Florida re re released finally all the documents from his committee. And uh, they were all redacted or um, censored by the state. And so a huge aspect of what I've been doing is trying to, anytime someone censors or something like that, it's not, they don't do a perfect job. For, so for example, you can see a name here. Um, mm -hmm. I've been uncensoring and going back and forth among thousands of documents trying to figure out Who's talking where? How did this start? Who were the informants? Who turned in the professors? Um, who were the people that uh, that went after the NAACP leaders? Um, so that's sort of been um, a lot of the process of writing this. It's very different from my first book, which was so, most of the information was readily available if you could find it. So you mm. were just I was just needle haystacking. And then um, mm. and then once you got the needle, you know, uh, it wasn't censored. So I could, I, and so then, then you um, take that piece of written documentation, you use oral history and interview, you create that Venn diagram of ev overlapping evidence. That's the comfort zone for creating scenes, right? In narrative nonfiction in the past, mm -hmm. reconstruction mm -hmm. it's called. Um, but, oh, um, but that was, uh, that was different. So this is even more of a challenge where I, I needle haystack, you find the needle and the needle's been tampered with by the state. <laughs> I mean, that seems like such an undertaking just to get the uh, documents, right? So they've released it. You, I think you mentioned to me the other day, you have like, a, is it a dozen or so of uh, dossier or folders and boxes that have all of these documents? It's, it's 30 thousands bankers of boxes, um, which I'm not supposed boxes. to have. Technically, Florida, think, the state of Florida thinks they're in possession of the only copies of these documents that they keep under lock and key at the state archives, where mm -hmm. there are archivists there serve two masters. They serve the state and supposedly the researcher, too. Yeah. But anyway, so I have um, one of the original researchers of the Johns Committee in the late 1970s and 1980s, I guess, received the sympathy of then the Senate librarian such that when they were creating the initial copies, they gave this really amazing researcher, her name is Bonnie Stark, because I want to credit her. They gave her a secret second copy of all of the Johns Committee records that she kept in her basement um, for like 25 years or something like that. And then when I contacted her, she gave them to me. I have all of them. Wow. In my, in my, I'm not supposed to, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, but I'm out of state. So what are they going to do? But like, so um, my it's husband, yeah. I know. No, so my no. husband is um, apoplectic. He needs, I need an office besides this one because he doesn't like that I have these 30 bankers boxes in our New Orleans apartment. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's gonna murder me, really. But like, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's good. That's it's a good problem to have. Is that it's a problem lawyers have, right? We're in the midst of discovery in civil cases or criminal cases where they all have to share each other's information. Lawyers will will oftentimes confront hundreds of boxes of materials and need to find the one document that's valuable to them out of that. So mm. I like these challenges. I'm learning new things and I'm having to confront, you know, new hurdles that I, that I hadn't faced in my first book. And I think that's really the only way you, you get better as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, and building relationships too. And it's fantastic that you met this person, you're able to get um, your hands on those sort of archives. It's, it's yeah. interesting, like how those sort of um, textual documents just find their yeah. way from the floors to basements and, you know, into journalists' hands or yeah. researchers' hands. And sometimes it's just asking or finding through happenstance by doing that. Um, yeah, collegial alliances are important. So like every book I've written has been someone has taken mercy on me and given them all, given me something that provides me, you know, unlocks the safe that allows me to start writing the story. And if, if mm. Bonnie Stark hadn't given me all the John's committee papers, it would be a lot harder for me to reference all only just photographs I've taken of, of thousands on thousands of digital documents, which I have mm-hmm. as another source of reference, but then I can, now I can use them both together. Um, and that's helping me out a lot. Fantastic. I mean, and so you took uh, a portion of these, or I think you were, we were talking about sort of digital work too, but you're at, you're out of New Orleans right now. You're near the Hamptons, right at the water mill center. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit about, about the Watermill Center and yeah. then sort of why I do research and writing at something yeah. uh, at a place like the, the Watermill Center. The Watermill Center is a arts center that is run by the famous writer and playwright and performer, et cetera, uh, named Robert Wilson, who is a very queer friendly artist. It is, it's located in Watermill, Long Island, which is like the one of the easternmost tips of the Hamptons. And it's, uh, they provide uh, various residencies at different stages uh, for mm-hmm. artists. So um, for mid-career artists, for late career, late career artists, and then they also have an open call for early career artists, which is what I qualify as. I have just one book. And um, I, one. I'd, heard, <laughs> I'd heard about it for, well, I don't know. I mean, I just wrote one. So like I, yeah, I, uh, I, I, apply, I applied my, um, I'd heard about it actually through my husband and other places. And then a good friend of mine who's a queer historian named Hugh Ryan, he wrote a book that I really admire called When Brooklyn Was Queer, um, had um, Hugh Ryan attended here as a resident that he, he just applied during open call. So I applied too, and I am now writing in the room, same room, same writer's room that Hugh wrote his wonderful book in, which I love. I can feel like the, the, the collective pooled energy. Uh, hopefully oh, yeah. lifting, lifting me up and hopefully maybe from a distance lifting him up too. Although he just finished his second book. I'm really excited. The guy's name is Hugh Ryan. I would, I, I highly recommend looking at his work, but so Excellent. anyway, so um, it's a large expansive art center that also has a separate uh, living quarters that they provide free of charge for you called the air house for artists and residents is air. And it's this um, aesthetically amazing, almost sort of a wooden wood beam constructed. um, It looks like a farmhouse from the exterior, but it's perfectly positioned according to the compass. So such that the sunrise rises on the Eastern side where there's this gorgeous, like gorgeous use of light that comes through. Then at at noon, there's a skylight where the light goes perfectly down into the atrium. Then at sunset, the West side, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. So a lot of attention is paid to aesthetics here. Um, and, and design principles. And um, mm. being in an environment like this um, is in, amazingly conducive to creative output. Pretty much everything designed here is designed to inspire or stimulate, but not overpower a creative mind that has their own project. So mm. not just a writer, I'm, I'm the, actually the only writer in my cohort, but there are, in the next room, I can occasionally hear there's a, a performance artist team that's putting together an installation together. Or um, there's, a, there's a wonderful tapestry artist um, over in the air houses where her studio space is, where, um, where she's looking at, she creates these tapestry, um, these tapestry creations that have characters in them that, that she's then looking now to animate with dancers and actors and actresses to form a kind of uh, theatrical piece. 
So all of that, um, all of that creates a groundswell from which you can sort of arrive at a place like here with a plan um, and with limited distraction um, and really get some stuff done in a way that doesn't feel torturous. Where, mm -hmm. which, and the reason that uh, it, it doesn't feel torturous is that a lot of um, competing stimuli and a lot of really aesthetically nasty stimuli that's just part of our world, not everything's well designed, um, gets in the way oftentimes of the creative process such that in normal life, normal Bobby, I, I always find myself, I'm like a sniper in the, mor in, the, in the morning. I'm trying to line myself up to take my one shot for the day, <laughs> my one real, and I'll, I'll, I'll wait, you know what I mean, to really go for it and hope that it works. Um, and, and here I can do that a couple times a day, which is nice. They provide also lunch. They cook a vegetarian, very healthy, wonderful lunch for you, which I thought I would not like. What I'm going to go, I, I eat lunch so fast. My golden zone as a writer is 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So oftentimes I just, I rush through lunch. Um, yeah. And I don't, like I don't want to, yeah. I oftentimes don't want to gab. You know, I don't want a small time. I mean, like, I'm like Larry David like that. So like, I thought mm -hmm. just having to go down to this lunch talk to all these artists are they gonna have money people there i gotta fluff the money like you know what i mean like i don't know what it's gonna be in exchange for this meal and me being here for you know for free and they give they give you a little bit of money too to to cover your expenses for coming here and uh no it's just a, it's a wonderful convivial collegial conversation that animates me i and i and it propels me into my afternoon work and i sort of um i see why europeans take a long lunch and then a siesta and then go back to it. Like that, there, there's another way to do it. We just don't culturally do that here. Yeah, um, that, I was just going to say that, um, uh, Hiroki Marikami also talks about naps being really important into part of his process. Um, and it also just reminds me of some of the basic things that we need. Sometimes it's just natural light. And that's so fantastic that you're getting fed, you're getting in a, you're in a position where, yeah, you're you're getting natural light all day. You're not sort of getting you know punched down by uh, uh, fluorescent lights and things like that all the time. But they're all you know figuring into mm -hmm. this creative process that we kind of take for granted. I think sometimes um, when we're we're working on stuff in our own I agree sort of places. Yeah, we exist in a world too that I think doesn't respect the creative process. Doesn't understand it. It's not, and they don't. That doesn't respect the fact that creativity isn't linear or sequential, and will constantly try to tell an artist who needs extra things or who just wants a little bit of support that you're being cosseted, right? You're being fluffed. You don't need this stuff. You're a baby. Whereas, mm -hmm. like here, I can show you in my studio. Being surrounded, this is like by original artworks. This is an original Noguchi that was in a Martha Graham dance piece in the 70s. This is the model that the, the, the bronze sculpture <laughs> of this um, wow. is actually in the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City in New York, which is one of the actually one of the great museums people should go visit if you're into Noguchi. But anyway, I mean, I'm close to this. I can like, <laughs> I, it's not a museum. I can touch any art piece. There's a there's a portrait of Isabella Rossellini right next to me done by Robert Maplethorpe. It's an original. Being around, surrounded by all that validates and places value around, around your creative process, around you, and it makes you think um, that this work is worth it and that your process isn't just silly stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned having lots of time to, to think through and sort of commit periods of writing throughout the day, you know, in addition to that 10 to three sort of sweet spot, which is yeah. very close to my heart as well. It's about 10 to two, 10 to two 30. Yeah. And then I kind of do things that are non-writing. And the other day you and I were talking about that, these kind of non-writing periods we get. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering if you could kind of help maybe those who are uh, tuning in, understand what kind of you mean or what you value about these non-writing processes or, or sure. periods of time. Yeah. Yeah, well, most of I find writing a non, I'm, I come from a reporting background like you. So most of um, nonfiction writing for me is, and especially in book writing, is reporting. And it's an extensive reporting period during which there is no word count being produced. I don't like write the, write the chapters as I go or anything like that. I'm, I'm a greedy gnome, like gathering my mound of gold. And I'm trying to find out stuff 
I'm learning every day. Every day I'm learning something new. I'm talking to new people. I'm trying to make new friends. I'm like meeting other experts who care about this stuff. And that part is fun. I love reporting. <laughs> if I could, there are some people who think like some, there are some journalists who hate writing too. I don't, I like writing as well, but like I love the reporting process and reporting is fun to me. I feel like Sherlock Holmes, like trying to unlock, you know, mysteries um, and things that were, things that were hidden, things that were buried. I'm unburying. I'm exposing. I mean, that's fun, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, that's about 75% of the work because in nonfiction writing, we can't make up what's interesting. And style is only going to get you so far, at, like in a scene, I find. Where I'm, if I'm writing a scene and I'm trying really hard with the verbiage, I can usually tell I haven't reported enough. Mm. I can, I can mm. tell. Mm. Like if I'm, um, I'm writing a scene right now about University of Florida, Gainesville, what college life was like in the late 50s for privileged whites. So I'm talking about how at, at homecoming that there's a, there was a homecoming sweetheart who is one, a given woman who was crowned during alumni weekend every year um, and how the, the college president would give an annual Christmas address that people looked forward to. And I'm thinking like, this is nothing like colleges now. But then I like, I'm like, well, what's the underbelly here? And I found like a whole other sub story in my reporting that I was like deciphering here of pregnant women in trouble at the University of Florida would then get shuffled off to mother and baby homes. Um, but run by this guy, it was called the Southern Rescue Workers. I don't even like the title. And, mm. and uh, they would be cloistered there. Then they would have their babies, which would be sold at exorbitant fees by the service. The, the, the mothers would receive no financial benefit to adoptive parents and if the mother oh, what happened are you still here we lost you for a second oh okay uh, they're listening they're listening okay. in on you <laughs> oh, no worries i guess yeah yeah they would uh they would be then threatened with financial fees financial destitution like they they would say whatever your turn but anyway the only reason i can write that is because i found it um and I could then, I could have written stylistic sentences like, but the underbelly was like, I could have done what memoirists do, you know? And mm -hmm. um, that's fine. I love a great stylized sentence. Um, I just, I find my writing doesn't hinge as much on style. So yeah, it's, uh, it's um, but th th there's anxiety. The, the whole period of time of information gathering can be really anxious, especially for someone who has a book contract and a deadline, because you're thinking mm -hmm. the best way to help yourself would be to write as you go before you know what the heck you're writing about. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that's a waste. Like it, um, the creating of an outline in the end after you've assembled the gold mound is the way to go for me. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. uh, that means I will spend in between books, sometimes years, not writing another book. <laughs> and I'm yeah. willing to do that because that's just the way I work. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's a good point. It, uh, for me, it's about that balance or that constant tension between I want to get words on the page and I want to read through transcripts and dwell on the transcripts. And I think like, if I can sort of, I'm still, I'm constantly working on that. I'm sure like that's a, that's a constant sort of work in progress for a lot of writers is to decide um, how much do you value putting just anything on the page just so you can say I met that target. Right. Yeah. I use Scrivener. I don't know if you do, but I do that. No. And I look at like, um, you know, it gives me readouts, of word targets, like yeah. you've got to do this many words today. And sometimes I'm just going for that bell, that notification that I yeah. met it. But I'm realizing like, maybe That's if good. I spend a few, yeah, spend a few weeks on that. Um, just you're dwelling in and reading. Mode, though. You're in writing yeah. mode. You've done your research. So you're then mm -hmm. you're in the phase I'm in right now where you make word count a day. You just mm -hmm. try Sometimes you get, you just try to make the word count. Anything on the page is better than nothing on the page because you know mm -hmm. it's all going to be rewritten um, right. and be rewritten better and clarified. And then, but it, the, anything on the page is better than the existential dread of a blank page. My God, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the hardest is starting. So you, yeah. if you can give yourself anything, I mean, that's good. And then, and uh, you finish, you know, you'll be, I, I mean, like I find that this way, you meet your word count up to the point that you, Right, and writers that meet their word count every day or, or however many days a week they give themselves. Some some take a weekend, some don't. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, if you meet your word count, eventually you'll discover momentum. And mm -hmm. um, writers that discover momentum finish chapters. 
and writers that finish chapters finish books. Mm. Yeah, I, I I need to follow all of your your wisdom. This is great. Um, <laughs> I don't follow some of my own advice a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you one one more question or so. Sure. And um, thanks to everybody who's been chatting as well about um, petitioning in York to have the like, spaces to write uh, things like that. That's that's a whole another thing. I think maybe we could do in the new year is where can we go on campus to actually maximize like writing in sunlight and things like that. Um, but what I want to ask you, Bobby, is, you know, through all of this, whether you're not writing or you are, you're kind of telling these, and you really are, you're telling these difficult stories, right? These mm -hmm. traumatic sort of incidents that yeah. happened, whether it's contained to Florida or New Orleans and so forth. So how do you manage that kind of uh, emotional labor of telling stories. I mean, there's the physicality of it, of going mm -hmm. and getting these documents, meeting people, but just yeah. sitting with those um, documents and so forth. How do you manage that? Um, okay, this is a th this is a really good question because, like, um, I've uh, I asked when I was writing my first book about traumatic subject matter, I asked a war zone reporter who would then was a dude, white dude, that just tried to tried to muscle his way through it and acted like all tough. When the truth mm -hmm. is, like, you take on the ancillary trauma of the stories you tell. And then in the end, when you've written the piece, you have to deal with the consequences of what you've learned. Mm -hmm. And you have to reconcile the difficult truths oftentimes you've learned with a world in which you want to live uh, mm -hmm. in order for your life to be good. So um, while you're writing, if they're, um, while you're writing these materials, I find um, uh, you make your word count and then uh, you have to make your word count in a place that's not your home. I, this is what I find. Then I go home, which is a separate place from my work, and I don't consciously think of or ponder or talk about my book. Now, granted, my husband, who, who maintains, we maintain this wonderful domesticity together, and I love, you know my husband, Ryan, he's amazing, mm -hmm. but my husband eventually, no matter what my project is, doesn't want to hear about it anyway. It's all self-indulgent mm -hmm. stuff. So, like, it's all writer stuff that he's, you know, he doesn't need to hear. So then we focus on that you learn questions that all writers need to say in order to nurture and develop all their other important outside relationships. Because your book is a main relationship in your life, but also to be a well-nourished human being, you have to have other relationships. And an important question is when you're crazy and few writing fugue state and you're in the midst of a book and you're self-important, you just ask your partner or friend, how are you? How is your day? Um, I find that's very helpful. Then they tell mm -hmm. you, and they're talking to you about something that has nothing to do with your interior world you're creating inside this book. Mm -hmm. And um, then you have a nice meal, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, if there's wine involved, that's nice. Um, and, uh, or if there's no wine involved, then, uh, then evening can be a good time for exercise or whatnot. Uh, meditation is very good. Uh, if you have a, I drink tea at night, if you like herbal tea, if you have a tea ritual mm, at any point in the day, yes. that's very nice. If you like dark chocolate, you can give yourself something like that. That's real. This is all good stuff. Writers and chocolate, very good relationship. Um, <laughs> honestly, I think no book, very few books have been written without, unless if someone has a chocolate allergy, without chocolate. I'm just being real with you. Mm, 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 um, and mm. then at the end of the day, you acknowledge the day's over, uh, accept or forgive yourself for whatever happened. Uh, you made your word count. You didn't make your word count. You made your word count, but it was, and it was great. You made your word count, but it sucked. Whatever. You go to sleep because your batteries are done. Don't, don't just accept the batteries are gone. The creative juices is like a battery that's, that refills at night and it's, it's stuck. And then you wake up and you repeat, you don your mental armor, right? You enter the mm -hmm. arena of your project. You go to the place where you're going to write, do battle on the page and, and, uh, and make your attempt to make your word count. It may work, it may not, but you showed up, okay? <laughs> you showed up mm -hmm, for it mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. you try. Um, and it sometimes is gonna work and sometimes it's not, and you repeat. And then mm -hmm. sometimes people, um, that's only uh, what I've described is, uh, it, it works with my golden zone, which is like 10 to three. Some writers are early morning writers, they're like, and they're like, they're, I call them farmers. So they get up with the, before the sun and even before they brush their teeth, they get their, you know, four hours worth of or so a day writing in and that's okay. Or some people are midnight writers. 
they um they they write late at night and then you're gonna have to accommodate how to get incorporate sleep which is very important also into into your schedule that's mm -hmm. what, that all matters and this is all vital daily self-care and then also the broader questions you were asking involving working with trauma dealing with serious um serious emotional weight and debt that you take mm -hmm. on um so uh i i after i finish a book that's very difficult or a project i i have a grief counselor i go to the uh, sim same counselor that like talks to um recent widowers and widows uh people or parents that had a surprise death things like that and i talk about the stuff in that way by paying the person to talk about the stuff i'm not later you know i'm not weighing down my husband and my friends with all my junk that's from my work Okay, so mm -hmm. and that that way I process it, and then I re I reframe a narrative of where I am able to incorporate difficult truths. Um, do I have a specific writing process, especially when you're dealing with so many research documents? Okay, I'll answer that in a little bit. Oh yeah, finish up. Yeah, and we can we can transition to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and then uh, that and then that way the junk gets uh, dealt with because otherwise it's going to find you. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of writers who write about hard stuff that take to drink, that in the middle of a book project become unbearable and they get divorced from spouses that they love who can't stand them anymore. This happens a lot, actually. Um, there are a lot of writers who um, uh, engage in self-destructive behaviors mm -hmm. um, they, uh, as, as a way to sort of try to wash the energy off. And eventually um, the junk's going to find you if you don't find it. So uh, that's that's how I, I'd rather try to handle it as best as I can, and then also uh, frame it around a larger narrative where you believe that you're doing something good. So I, mm -hmm. I have values about the truth and bringing the truth in the world where I think the truth matters. I think it's enough, right? And I think it um, I think it's the most interesting thing in the world. And I think bringing the truth into the world as best as I can sum it up is valuable. So. Um, those that sort of mantra of repeating that to myself on difficult days sometimes reminds me that I'm doing work that um, has some sort of broader purpose, and that's 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 what all therapy tries to get you to is the broader hmm. purpose stuff. Wow, um, we need to talk more about while we're working on these books. I feel like that's going to be super helpful. Like about uh, just you know sort of what we're working through and. Um, also keeping it contained to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, fellow writers rather than bringing it that kind of junk <laughs> at home, you know, sometimes. Yeah. Um, so you were talking a lot about your process, uh, you know, and especially self-care management and, um, et cetera. Anything else you do during the writing process or you're doing now that you want to sort of mention while you're managing these, you know, uh, sort of dealing with these research projects as Dia has asked us? Um... You try to just be uh, at various points. You need to constantly remind yourself to be kind to yourself that you're doing something hard. That um, writing a book, you're, you're uh, is writing at the highest level. Um, you're managing the highest word, word count that a human brain can account for, can wrap itself around. And there's a reason why not everyone can do it. And there's a reason why um, it's difficult. Uh, and there's a reason why some people you can understand because in the, when you're in the midst of it, why some people, uh, you know, lose hope or mm -hmm. uh, or all sorts of other things. It's very natural. And most of the time, uh, about 75 percent of the way through your writing process, even after you have your junk, your, your first manuscript, I call it my junk manuscript. Um, the book is bad. It's not it's not what you hope you've hoped for at this point you don't really love it yet you're still trying to raise you're, you're still mm. the, the cookies are still baking <laughs> um, so um reminding yourself of constantly of process and the marathon nature of it um book time is tree time it ages very slowly uh, these things take a while to develop and that um that that will that sort of at least um helps give me faith and hope that at the end of the process I won't hate the thing I've created, and I haven't thus far. Um, I've, I, 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 a lot of writers I know don't actually don't like their own book. When mm -hmm. you get them down, like if you set them down and really get them in a good conversation, I don't know why people tell me these things, but I actually, um, I, I'm in a, I don't know, I'm in a blessed position because I, I do like, I look, I like what I wrote, and I like what I write. Um, mm -hmm. 
I don't think it's the best, you know, I mean, like, I don't like, I won't say it's grandiose or anything like that, but I, um, I, I have the relationship I have with my own work at the end when I look at it I, is healthy and getting to that point is, is important, I think, for writers. <laughs> it sounds like you're really enjoying the the marathon, as you sort of mentioned, and that it's really a nice way to bring it full circle to what we were mentioning about Mirakami is just those sort of helpful metaphors for thinking about writing. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, really appreciate you coming on. This has been great, Bobby. Thank you for Rich, joining us. And I, I, I love talking writing with you, man. How long have we yeah. gabbed about writing? Years, right? Yeah, we used to send each other letters. Um, we we text, we call each other about processes. I think you were in advertising, and I was working for a community newspaper, and yeah. then eventually for a weekly. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's so it's nice to see it like come back. To, we find our writers always find their way back to each other in different yeah. ways. So it's been great. Um, Bobby, where can we find you online? This is your website I've got pulled up, and you've got yeah. the same sweater on. It's lovely. I, know. I think you. I think you do. And um... I wear the same. I, I'm like <laughs> I, I'm like an old professor where I wear the same outfits, and I don't know how you could have Target planned this me. better. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, like I. Uh, this is, you know how like a uh, Salinger would wear pa a painter's smock every day when mm. he would go into his barn to mysteriously write his uh, in New Hampshire to write his manuscripts that have never been seen before. But anyway, so like I I think about it like that where I I have. I have favorite T-shirts that Ryan wants to throw away that I just won't. That if I'm if I'm a write on a writing day, so yeah, I don't know how, but I'm wearing the same sweater that was in this photograph that was taken in my former. That was my Golden Zone writing spot at the Boston Athenaeum on uh, wow. three and a half. It was like mm -hmm. such, it was like mm -hmm. a mine castle, the library. Um, Amazing. And that's when I was in the midst of writing my first book, and that's my that's my dog Chompers, who's no longer with us. Like um. Book writing uh -huh. takes time. It goes through lots of spans of time and a lot of things will happen in a life in between one book and another. Um, and that's just, Sarah, yeah. you know, emphasizes the, 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 the permanent nature of what we're trying to create, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, a book lasts on a shelf. Um, it doesn't need much once it's sitting on the shelf to keep going. Um, and that's, that's a really special thing about it. Hopefully future, future generations can find this stuff. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, Rich, I, I love, I love Gavin writing with you, man. I do. Yeah, let's do it again. It'd be great. Um, well, thanks to everybody who's been checking out uh, the stream and asking all of your questions in the chat. Um, and Bobby, yeah, we'll look out for you on your website as well as yeah. you're on Twitter and Instagram. And I think I've noticed yeah. you talk a lot I, about your process on Instagram as well. And you've even done chats on there too. So Sometimes, yeah, I'm, a, I'm at Word Bobby, W-O-R-D-B-O-B-B-Y on the places um, on, on Facebook and Instagram. And then you can just search my first and last name uh, from my website it should pull it up yeah and um, i love a comment you have in this comment here was is working on writing which is sometimes not working something to that effect <laughs> and fantastic reminder that it's okay sometimes if we can't do that yeah. um but, but yeah once again thanks so much and um yeah we'll we'll talk to you hopefully again soon love you buddy thank you okay bye all right, bye. All right. well folks this has been amazing and um really really enjoyed that chat with um with bobby and again as you, you sort of heard we've we know each other for a very long time and um uh, yeah you know as you're sort of moving on in your in your various worlds as writers and in your career it's it's hard to stay connected and so this is a nice way to to reconnect and talk about um these really amazing processes uh that have figured into um his first book and his second one coming up so yeah, um, thanks again for everybody for the chat. So we have just a couple minutes left and I like to bookend this with a reminder of sort of how things, um, so, you know, uh, will look like going forward with, with our, um, uh, what do you, what do you call it? Um, excuse me. I'm losing my train of thought. I think the, the medicine is now kicking in for my, uh, my allergies, but, um, bookending, sort of the live stream series, what you can think about moving ahead, and then just some additional resources we might think about uh, for this topic. All right, so as I mentioned, like next week we'll be talking about moving writing from the page to the web and then cozy vibes and the winter writing winter writing prompts that you can sort of think about. Uh, so this might be a continuation for December 1st, this, this continuation of self-care. I mean, what can we do to get ourselves like in that sort of situation where we're really comfortable with, either it is the environment in which we're writing or um, 
the kind of tools and resources we use to feel a bit more connected. I'm really excited about next week, particularly too, because this is a time when you're working on, let's say, a major project that you eventually want to put into um, something like a web page. What are some resources you can use from WordPress to sort of hand coding? Probably won't really get into the latter part of hand coding, but we will get into um, some kind of quicker ways, more efficient ways of kickstarting some of your work um, as you're moving it from the page, even handwritten pages to websites. All right. And I didn't mention this before, but I have a link in our show description too of self-care journal prompts to improve mental health. And I could cover all of these or uh, lots of different ones you can think about. Um, but there's just a, a nice reminder that self-care for everyone today is essential. This is also essential because oftentimes like our writing situations are conflated with what we're doing sort of every day. Like a lot of us can't leave our homes still um, for one reason or another. We can't do sort of international travel. Um, and even if we want to do sort of a retreat somewhere that's local, there are likely some protocols um, that, you know, make it a little difficult, right? If we have to sort of book certain days or follow sort of cleaning and necessary, I would add sort of protocols to, to say, sit at a coffee shop, right? Um, it may not be as conducive. So these prompts are also, I think, interesting to think about just in terms of journaling. You know, if you're asking questions about like, what was a happy time that you recently felt? It doesn't have to be about writing. Um, stream of consciousness is sort of writing that, you know, whether it's what you want to have for lunch, you know, in the next like 10 minutes like me. Um, and just the first things that sort of pop into your head. I keep, for example, a writing study um, kind of journal about my own research process. And I leave that in a journal specifically by hand just because it's a place for me to kind of emote how I'm feeling about um, something or another. And I also leave voice memos to myself if something went terribly wrong in a research process. So I'm looking forward to kind of going back at that later and maybe laughing about it retrospectively, about the time I got burned, for example, uh, in an interview uh, with you know, uh, a certain participant I was working with and sort of what I learned in response um, from, um, from that experience. Write a letter to someone you love or you appreciate. You know, it could be a fellow writer. I, I certainly need to write more love letters to Bobby because he's doing amazing work. Um, there are some other deeper ones about apologizing to yourself or like having sort of negative thoughts, a sort of repository for that. Your goals, sensory journals. So, you know, if you're walking about and you're just writing about what you see, hear, and feel, that's a good form of meditation they're arguing here on, on this website. Perfect day of self-care, tracking your emotions and, and moods as you go. An awesome day you're looking forward to. I mean, it goes on. Also, and I don't know if this is because of the sort of ambient listening that sometimes technologies claim or people claim that technologies do. But the other day, when, or actually yesterday when I was preparing for this um, stream, the App Store just randomly showed me like ways of sort of handling self-care and, and uh, making way for your mental health. So you may see this as well. But there's also a number of resources that are linked on here about um, talk space and sort of better help. That's been kind of publicized. It seems like on a lot of different like podcasts, or websites lately, um, mood trackers, headspace. I've seen adverts for that too, like music that's been sort of composed by a particular artist to sort of, to get you in that sort of meditative space. And then just, you know, really what we were talking about a, a few minutes ago is just journaling. That can be super helpful. Um, and again, even if you're on a deadline, carving out maybe 10, 15 minutes just to write in a space um, other than the page that you're sort of turning into an essay, but on deadline, it can be really powerful. Um, and it doesn't have to be just written or sort of suggesting here like that. You could do photos and audio and sketches. All of that might be really beneficial in terms of your self-care practices. Okay, so that's all I have, folks. Check those out. 
And um, like I said, next week, November 24th, moving writing from the page to the web. Also going to mention, um, as I usually do at the end of this, I'm always available for one-on-one -on -one appointments on Thursdays from 10.30 to 2.30. If you ever want to talk about those as well, um, during those sessions, that is, feel free to come see me uh, in the Writing Center. I'll be doing that um, through early December. If not, you can always reach out to me on the YouTube channel or via my email. Um, other than that, have a great rest of the day. Have a great lunch, and we'll see you next time.